Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on creating an ID variable in Microsoft Excel. When working on counseling research in terms of data management, I like to use Excel to manage data, collect and organize data, and usually I use SPSS to analyze the data. So although you can create an ID variable in SPSS, and I have another video that shows you how to do that, I prefer to create the ID variables here in Excel along with all the other variables that I use for various research projects. So I have here in this Excel worksheet uh, some fictitious names and dates of birth. I also have a gender variable here. And I want to show you some different ways to insert ID variables with different levels of security. So for example, the kind of the classic ID is just a sequential, they're just sequential numbers, right? So you have, now of course most study would have more than four participants, but say you just had these four participants and you wanted to create an ID, you could start with 1001 and then enter in 1002 and just auto-fill that down uh, for as many records as you need here. Of course, just have the four. And this is, a, this is a fairly good way to create an ID, especially if you're sending your data set out to be analyzed by another institution or agency, right? So you go in, you have this ID, you'd have the other variables that are relevant to the study, and you would take variables such as name, and date of birth and delete them uh, from the record, from the data set. So the other researchers would just be using the ID number and then the relevant variables. So if gender was a focus of the study or one of the variables used, you'd want to keep that in. And of course you'd have other variables as well, such as a, a treatment group or control group, uh, different levels of uh, a treatment independent variable. Uh, you may have different scores on various instruments. You would include that information, but identifying information uh, you want to greatly restrict, uh, especially when you're sending it to an outside institution or agency. Although technically it would be governed by whatever arrangement you had with that uh, agency or institution. But I want to show you some different ways internally to create more complex ID numbers. Uh, so say that uh, inside of an agency or institution you're sharing your data set with other individuals and they're going to examine it for different purposes. You're going to analyze the data, uh, perhaps asking different research questions and having different hypotheses. So these are individuals uh, that have, in most instances, would have the authority to see the full data set. You know, they work for the same agency or institution and they'd be bound by the same obligations to keep the data confidential and the data set would be transmitted either via flash drive or using a secure uh, company email. Uh, but even still, in a situation like that where the other individuals that you're sending the data to uh, would have the right to see the entire data set, you may still want to, and I think it's a good idea, to take out identifying information. Uh, you can always, when the sheet is sent back to you with whatever analysis the, the results are, you can always repopulate these uh, identifying variables back into your data set. Now, whenever you move something to a flash drive or send it through an email, even a secure email, you introduce an element of risk, specifically the risk that somebody who's not authorized to see the identifying information or any of the information will gain access to the data set. So one way to do this would be just to delete the identifying information and just use this sequential ID system I've introduced over here. Now, the problem with this is that this data set could be edited by multiple individuals and when a final version 
is saved and returned to you, some of the data may be restructured in a way that's challenging for you to analyze because the structure deviates from the initial structure that you used when you were collecting the data. For instance, an individual could copy the identifying information without copying the ID, paste that to another worksheet, sort it in various ways, and then uh, they paste it back, it may not align with your variables any longer. So when you try to reconnect your ID variable with the participant's name, it could be very challenging. So you can see in this instance, it might be convenient to create an ID that does have some identifying information, uh, but it's cryptic. You know, it's, in a, it's stored in a manner where it'd be difficult to figure out uh, who this is, like for this 1001SN. It'd be difficult to figure out which participant this is associated with. But when you receive the data set back, it, it wouldn't be terribly difficult for you to figure it out because you would know the formula that created that ID number. So let's take a look at this first example. This one's fairly straightforward. I have the sequential ID and then the first initial of the last name and the last letter of the first name. So first letter of the last, last letter of the first. So here we would start, uh, f first I would start with the formula to, to, or the function to calculate or to return the letters that I want. So this would just be uh, left and then the text, this is the uh, argument it's looking for, would be the name and the number of characters would be one. So let's just start there. You can see it returns a capital W. Okay, and that's important. I'll come back to that in momentarily. And then uh, ampersand, let's go with right. And again, the same text. And again, one character. And notice that it returns the last letter of the first name but you have an uppercase here and a lowercase which should, could be a clue to somebody looking at the ID number uh, that the W is the first letter of the first or last name. You know, so the way to fix this uh, or make this a little safer would be to use the lower function which converts all the letters to lowercase. So there you have the WT. And then now is where I put on the uh, sequential ID, which would just be a matter of um, selecting that cell and then ampersand. And then for the rest of these, you could just autofill. And you can see that with being lowercase, it's kind of cryptic. You don't know where the letters came from necessarily. Uh, they don't know if it's at the beginning of the first or last name because it's they're both in lower case. Now let's say you have a, a extremely large data set. Right? So it, of course I'm just working with four for this example, but say you're working with several thousand. Well, there could be instances uh, where there'd be duplication with these letters. So you could step up the specificity by a level uh, by adding in this case the month that the individual was born. Right, so I'm going to just take this entire function and copy it and then just paste it into the function bar here. And just to change things up, I'll make this upper to show you that you have upper or lower. Right, So this will be uppercase. It achieves the same thing. It makes it unclear as to what letter you're taking from the name. But now you want to add the uh, month that the individual was born. So it would just be uh, ampersand and month and then go to the date of birth. And you can see August of course is month 8 and now you have 
a more specific identifier. But again, to an individual looking at this uh, who didn't know the uh, code you're using, so to speak, uh, they would not know what this means. And similarly, you could autofill this. Right. So again, this one's using the month uh, after the first letter of the last name and the last letter of the first name. So an ID number uh, like ID2 here or ID1, again, relatively easy to connect back in case the data set is scrambled. Of course, this one would be a little easier, especially in a large data set. I want to show you a few other examples of creative ways you can create an ID. So I'm going to uh, copy this function over into the next column. You see, of course, it has the same output now. And this one has a few changes. And this one, instead of month, I switched over to day, which is just the day function. You see uh, this individual born at 819, so the day was 19. Now you could also use year, and I'll show you this, but I think this is a little too identifying uh, because you see 1943, uh, for example, that seems pretty clear that's potentially a year. We're using the day, which is 19, it's a little less clear where you found that number. So for this variable, I'm going to add a level of complexity. I'm going to add a function that will evaluate the gender and return a number based on male and female. And again, you know, only you would know what this is as the researcher constructing a data set. So we'll start with ampersand uh, to combine. It'll be if, and we'll select uh, h3. So if h3 equals male, and that needs to be in quotes, the value is 0. If not, the value is 1. So you can see in this case it adds a 0 to the end of the ID number. But again, only you would know what this is. So it's 190. It's very hard just looking at this to figure out that's the day and that the male equals 0 and the female would be 1. So we ought to fill this down. You can see it's 1, 2, 1. Born on the 12th day and female. It'd be fairly difficult to figure that out. And then for the last example here, I'm just going to show you kind of how you can be a little more creative uh, in creating an ID or another way to be creative in creating an ID. So I'm going to copy the function I was just working with, but I'm going to be making a lot of changes to it. So first in this one, there won't be any conditional statement or the uh, and the date of birth won't be used. So I'm going to delete all that. So you see it looks more similar to ID1 except it's an uppercase. And we have the uh, left statement here. I'm going to highlight this whole area and redo this to find something different. So I'm going to use uh, mid and then the name, then find the space, quotation mark, space, quotation mark. And now it asks for within text, that's going to be the name again, F3. Close that parentheses. And now it's looking for the start number, which will be 1. And I'll close the parentheses. However, I'm going to go back to find. I'm going to put a plus 1 there. So I'm going to find the space in this string and then add 1 to that. So you can see, and, I, and I'm going to add another part in a moment, but you can see now what it does is using a combination of mid and find instead of the left function I had there before is now it's searching for the space and it's returning one character to the right of that which is the R and of course it's still giving me the last letter of the first name so now it's the first letter of the first name and the last letter of the first name so 
a different way of going about it. And then just to add a little more complexity to it, uh, to make it a little more specific, I'm going to add the length of the whole string. So ampersand len for length, and then you see it's 16. So there's 16 characters in this string. So as you can see here, I've given you a variety of ways to configure ID variables so that participants' personal information is not easy to derive. However, uh, this is no substitute for encryption. For using these type of IDs, I, I would still re recommend constricting it to just uh, individuals authorized to see th all the information. Uh, this is just an ad level security uh, for the participant because this data set would be, in theory, you know, in that situation inside an agency or institution uh, where you did have, you know, in those instances where you did have permission to send the entire data set anyway. This is an added level security for the participant. Now, as I mentioned, this is not a substitute for encryption. And no matter what your level of security, you must be familiar with the rights of the participants and the limits of the research study in terms of where the information can be sent. I hope you found this video on creating an ID variable in Excel to be useful. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me, and I'll be happy to assist you.